So hello and welcome, Dr. Eugene Bogristov speaking and today I record a new video dedicate, dedicated to the topic of discrete choice experiments as a method and today I'm going to talk about how to write a methodology section because I regularly receive requests from my students and from visitors of my channel on YouTube about how to write a methodology section. Usually I ask, I ask them to download one of my papers where we describe discrete choice experiment as our methodology and today I think I will just, I'm going to give you some ideas, some tips and also go one of the methodology sections or two of them and just explain why we wrote it and what was the idea behind it. So the first thing that you have to think about is uh, where are you going, what kind of journal it is. And there are like more general journals or the conferences like the Academy of Management conference and the likelihood that you will get a reviewer who is familiar with the method is very low. It means that you have to describe very precisely what you did, how you did it, and what are the main assumptions of a discrete choice experiment. Uh, the same applies if you write your master or your bachelor thesis, because you have to be also more precise and you have to show to your supervisor what you did. And think about the following, that not only your supervisor is going to read your work, it can be also other people. That is why it is good if you are a bit more precise and explain step by step the things that might be obvious for the others. And the second one, we come to the others, are these special journals uh, that has to do, that usually have to do with this methodology. For example, the Journal of Consumer Research or Journal of Consumer Behavior. They have reviewers who work with conjoint analysis, who work with discrete choice experiments. The same applies, by the way, to e-commerce. And the likelihood that you get a reviewer who is familiar is very high. That is why you can be a bit shorter, because for this somebody who is familiar with the method, it will be like unnecessary information, redundant information. The other aspect that you have to take into account is the number of pages that you are allowed to submit. If you go to the Academy of Management conference, you are allowed to submit up to 40 pages, so you have plenty of space that you can use to describe your methodology. If you go to the Academy, uh, to APSIS, America's Conference on Information Systems, they have the limitation of only 10 pages. It means you have to be very short and very concise and very clean about your methodology, and at the same time, it is not a specific conference, so you have to be able to explain to your potential reviewers who are not from this methodological field what you did and why you did it. Overall, uh, if you think about the full methodology as I would do it, I would um, make the following structure for the methodology section. First of all, discrete choice experiment, what it is and how it works and why you decided to use one. Second one is ex experimental design. In this section, I would write about the attributes and levels and how you came up with them. It is about the operationalization. So you can theoretically call it also operationalization or experimental design and operationalization. Then we have model specification. I usually don't have this section, but uh, some reviewers from AMSYS, they asked us to introduce the model specification, the formula that explains how the statistics is going to be calculated. Then we have experimental procedure, where you describe how you conducted your experiment step by step, what the participants have seen, and what was the next stage, how much time they had, and so on. You can also write here, for example, your attention checks that you implemented in your discrete choice experiment or something like this. And finally, we have the sample. You can also introduce the subsection on sampling. So how you decided to create the sample, what of methodologies you use for sampling. This is good for a thesis, but it is usually not necessary for a conference or for a journal. And in a sample, you describe whom you tested your theory on, who was included, how many people, and so on. I have two papers open. The first one is the Academy of Management Proceedings paper from the Academy of Management Conference, the one that I wrote with Antonia Schweig and Daniel Beinborn. And this is the one where we had a bit more space, where we described the discrete choice experiment pretty detailed. Uh, the only tweak that we did with our experiment is that we ran also randomized experiment with a discrete choice experiment. So the participants, they underwent a manipulation where we manipulated social distance as a low social distance and high social distance. And then they had to participate in the discrete choice experiment. 
That is why we use this for this section. By the way, I will post the link to this paper in the description section of this video. No worries. In the first part, we explain what we did, that we did a randomized two-group experiment and a discrete choice experiment. And with the DCE, what we did for what? So with the DCE, we decided to test this. Uh, we decided to test the impact of social distance. And uh, with the discrete choice experiment, we tested different aspects of digitization and the preferences of our participants regarding this aspect. We also write here that both methods imply causality because what the action of a participant is caused by what they see in a discrete choice experiment or is impacted by what they wrote as the as our manipulation task for the high and low social distance. Then we go to the subchapter discrete choice experiment and here I write about what it is and what are the main assumptions. Here we talk about few theories. We talk about the utility theory and we talk about the expected utility theory and random utility theory. And we talk about the random characteristic theory. These are not the theories for your paper. This is the theory for the methodology that explains why it works. It explains why should people, if they see, for example, um, if they see two options decide to go for option A or option B. The Random, uh, the characteristic theory would say that there are some fit and some of the characteristics are necessary for the person and the person associates them itself with them. That is why the person prefers them. And the utility theory would say, expected utility, that they have some expectations. If they see the yellow car and the black car, they have the utility would be, for example, I'm a creative person, that is why I should drive a yellow car. Or I'm a classical person, that is why I should drive the black car. And this is also the kind of utility, how you position yourself in the society. So that is why it is important that you describe it, that people who first read it understand why it is an experiment and, and that there are some theories that explain that it will work. Uh, then we shortly explain that in a discrete choice experiment you have to work with two types of variables, the attributes and levels, and they are all independent variables, so the attribute is the category of or a set of variables and the level are these variables. So if your attribute is the color, the levels will be black, red, yellow, green, and so on. So the attribute is kind of the category for the variables that you are going to test. Each attribute is also a separate independent variable because you can also test the whole group, that the whole group, the in our events uh, organizational cost, are of more um, impact for your preferences then, for example, relational costs or HR-related costs. So you can work also with attributes as with a single variable, but you can also look at each level at each variables separately. I, I think if I, if I have time, I also make a video on how to report results, and then I'm going to show you also how you can report them. And we also gave here some examples of where we have these items and how they look like. Uh, but we also say here that if you want to have the all results, you can go to table one and table one you can see what we had. And I'm just going to scroll to table one, just I need to know that we'll get back to page 11. So the table one, this is our table one, and you can see what attributes we had and what kind of levels we used. So we had this attribute organizational costs and we had the following levels, temporal deceleration of business processes, excessive usage of company resources, and so on. Okay, so going back to where we were, page 11, yeah. Uh, then we also provide the research design or research model. In my newest paper, we have a, as a research model something different because in the research model, you can also show your hypothesis. This shows more of this was explorative study. That's why we can call this research design figure as a research model, but it is not completely correct if you have also hypothesis. And this is, first of all, this is how the experiment looked like. I think that your reviewers need to understand what actually you manipulated, what you showed to people. And this in our event were two projects and they had to select between them. And the levels that you see here are randomly selected from the table that you have seen before, the table one. And the figure one, let's say figure two, is the research model, how it looked like. You see, we had two manipulations. We had the randomized two-group experiment where we manipulated control uh, level as a high social distance, low social distance. 
uh, high social distance implies abstract thinking and high control, and low social distance implies concrete thinking and low control. And we had our discrete experiment with the three, actually with four attributes, the three that we wanted to test and the fourth one that we introduced in order to have a scalable variable and be able to calculate the willingness to, uh, to, to trade or to pay. Uh, so going back to the to the page, what else we did? And then we added the model. This is our model specification, and here you can see how we describe it. Uh, some people have the mathematical way of thinking; they would like to understand what is the final utility. What did you calculate? And you see that we calculated the average utility. That this is sum of utilities of different users. Users Q who confront different decision options and each of these decision options has a has a um, what was expected utility that they have and there's also alternative option that has some utility and so on and this is how they are calculated to um, that people can understand what you are at the end looking at and at the end we're looking at the population uh, the share of population choosing an alternative. When we have like exponential b, the odds ratios that the one option is selected over the odds ratio that the other option is selected, that the other attributes summed together will be preferred, and so on. So I hope I could explain it well, but if not, just please read it. You will understand it. It's pretty well explained. Finally, we write here about how we calculate the willingness to trade efficiency, because theoretically, if you know these if you have the scalable variable and i have it in one of my first videos in the playlist on discrete choice experiments you can understand <clears throat> in how much people value something so imagine that you show somebody two cars one in black one in yellow and the price tag is ten thousand euros then you show the next choice and it is and the person prefers black you select next choice and there's black and yellow black costs 1200 euros and yellow costs 1,000 euros, which one would you prefer? And they still prefer black. Then you say, okay, let's see the next option again, black and yellow, and black costs 1,400 euros. And then most people go for yellow. So what you know is that actually there is a, a kind of price tag that you can set on yellow as compared to black, that it is between the, it is about 400 euros, between the two and 400 euros. And you can theoretically make this calculation and see for all the attributes and all the levels you had, if you have this price tag or something scalable, you can convert the preferences regarding this level, regarding this attribute, in the units of the in the scalable units. If you have money, it is easy, then it's called willingness to pay, but you cannot always put a price tag. In this paper, for instance, we looked at the efficiency gain, because setting a price tag would make no sense. Uh, small firms, for them, 10,000 euro would be a, a lot of money, and for a big firm like IBM or Microsoft, even 100,000 euro for a digitization project would be almost nothing. That is why we decided that we introduce something like efficiency gain, and for IBM efficiency gain, and for the small startup efficiency gain, 10% would be meaningful and would imply different prices. That is why we calculate willingness to trade efficiency, but not willingness to pay. But it's just the same. You just say that people are willing to uh, sacrifice, let's say, 3% of the efficiency because they want to have certain attribute level. And we describe it also here. Then we come to the randomized to group experiment manipulation, as you might not have it, so we just skip this one. And we come in this paper to data collection and sample, where we explain how we collected data, why we selected the sample, whom we addressed, and so on. We focus, for instance, on users and developers. We um, here you also report what is the descriptive statistics of your sample size: how many were male, how many were female, how many developers, how many users, uh, what is the average age, and what is the standard deviation. Don't forget to report for all scalable variables the standard deviation. What is the mean experience and standard deviation? You can also describe here the sample, and it is important that you describe it well, because the reviewer wants to understand what is the external validity of your experiment. If you make an experiment on managerial decision-making and ask students, then there is an obvious problem. The students seldom have managerial experience. 
and it will be just imaginary answer that the external validity will be just lacking. That is why we needed to show here that we had also managers represented from different levels and we had people who were users and people who were uh, developers and that people had experience of work and, and so on and so on. Uh, at the end, in a discrete use experiment, it is important that you write not only a sample size, which was in this event, I'm trying to see, let's say 104 answers, not so much, but this 104 answers after deletion of the missing values and so on resulted in 1940 cases to analyze uh, due to missing observations, due to sorted out individuals and so on. Because remember, in a discrete choice experiment, each decision is a, some, is a separate case, and in each of these cases, you have actually two cases. You vote for option A and against the option B. So there will be like two decisions within one. And if you had to make 10 of such decisions, you have 20 for each participant, and if you have then 100, then you have all of a sudden 2,000 decision cases. Uh, what else? Ethics statement, an important section. Um, it will depend on your university. If you conduct it at university, you may have the number from your ethical committee. Uh, if your research involves other people, it can be also technical research or modeling. In this event, you don't need it. Anyway, ethics statement, take care to the um, guidelines of your university. If you are not sure, go to ethical committee. If not, go to somebody who works at the high level at the in this university, and you will find out what how exactly you can describe it. And that was it for this paper. So it was not too long, not too short, but it was well, as you see, a bit too much of the description. Now I'm going to show you another paper. This is the paper with Nadine Ostran from AMSIS, America's Conference Information System. And here we had only 10 pages, that's why we try to be more precise and we try to be more focused. First of all, we started methodology explaining why we use a discrete choice experiment. Why is it good exactly for this specific type of questions, what we wanted to address. Then we described again what is a discrete choice experiment, so pretty same logic, what are the theories behind the types of variables that you use and so on. Then we came to research design attributes and levels, and here we just, it is almost the same as in the previous paper, but we started with the decision option, how they look like. And then we move to the table with the attributes and levels, and here we explain what was the logic behind it and what is, for example, why we decided to take uh, the efficiency again instead of setting a price tag of 10,000 euros or something like this, 10, 11, 12 and more. Um, we also explained that we decided to call it project, price of the project and so on, so all the terminology described here. We had a very short section on experimental procedure and sample design. Originally it was bigger, where we explained it step by step, but the reviewers asked us to add a model specification, which is here in the results, but I usually put it into methodology, that's why we needed to shorten this um, piece of information. And model specification is very close to the one that you have seen before, where we just explain how the expected utility on average will be calculated. And that was it. When you are done with this one, you go to the main results. And I hope that I will record a new video on the results and will also teach you how to, how to do it. Links to both papers will be posted in the description below. Wish you all the best and good luck with your discrete experiments. Bye-bye.